Take a look at this picture. I'm sure most of you know what it is. But for someone who's had a stroke and has aphasia, they have a hard time coming up with the word apple. People who have a stroke and have aphasia have trouble communicating, understanding speech, and reading the newspaper. Here's what someone with a stroke sounds like. Do you understand why we're here for the evaluation? Well, a Tell me stroke, a bit about... mm -hmm. nothing. I'm uh, psyched and uh, nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, apple at a supply, mm -hmm. you know, ah, rip, okay. Ripley, mm -hmm. Eva, you know, mm -hmm. Becky and Bob, you know, you know, you know own it, mm -hmm. well, half and half. Okay. So what happened? When did you have your stroke? And what oh, happened? Houston, 1%. Uh, 1%? That's all. That's what they said? Yes. Mm, mm, mm. But I can't help it. So. So, as you can see, he has trouble coming up with simple words, formulating sentences, but he seems to understand what I'm saying. Unfortunately, the road to recovery and rehabilitation is a long and cumbersome one for people like this. They need several years of rehabilitation to improve what they can say. Sadly, there aren't enough resources and personnel to take care of these people and bring them back to their full recovery. The good news is that the brain is plastic. Work done in my lab and others' labs have shown that after a stroke, the brain can indeed recover. Work in my lab shows that we can understand how the, the neurons, the gray matter cells, are damaged and can recover function, how the white matter cables are damaged and can recover function. We have people do simple tasks such as reading words and sentences, and we look at what's going on in the brain, and we can see which parts of the brain are active when they're doing these simple tasks. We can also understand how the brain recovers as a network when it's trying to recover language. Let me give you an example of what goes on in my lab. We study people who've had left hemisphere strokes. They come into the lab and they do very simple tasks, such as reading words and um, understanding the meanings of words. As they're doing this, we scan their brains. And we do these 10 weeks apart. What we do in those 10 weeks is we provide them therapy to improve their language function. And what we see is that as these patients are improving their language function, they're decreasing in their activation, suggesting that as the brain is recovering this function, they're getting more and more efficient at doing that. We're also starting to see that the brain works as a network, and, it, and there are specific parts of the brain that work as a tag team. So one steps up to help out in function, the other one steps back down a little. What we seem to know today, at least, is that there are several regions in the brain that help take over function. They're the traditional left hemisphere language regions that are involved in doing their job. They're also corresponding right hemisphere regions that are involved in taking over a function. What's really interesting is that there is lots of regions in the brain that are not traditionally involved in language, but that step up to help recover language. What we're also starting to see is that when these regions step up, there's an increase in activation in the brain. There are also evidence showing that there are decreases in activation in the brain, but these are related to efficient processing, more automatic kind of processing. We know a lot about how the brain is uh, recovering after a stroke, but we've also done a lot of work looking at how the language is processed in the brain. We know a lot about how words are processed, how people produce sentences. What we're starting to see now is that in these individuals who have a stroke, they're also having problems with attention uh, in tasks. They're also having problems problem solving as well as inhibiting irrelevant distractors. They're also having problems with uh, planning and reasoning. When it comes to aphasia rehabilitation, however, we have a long way to go. We do know that therapy works for these individuals, but we don't know which treatments to provide for what kinds of patients. Therefore, therapy is not standardized or individualized. It's actually quite sad 
clinicians who work with these patients work in a very archaic way where they're looking um, at flashcards and cartoons and paper and pencil tasks. Compare that to everything else that you do today, be it buying shoes online or buying airline tickets. It's on demand and it's personalized. The good news is that with technology, we can actually reach large numbers of patients who have smartphones and tablet devices. This allows patients the access to therapy, much like the way they can access Uber, and it allows us to reach patients at a large scale while looking at the same individual patient separately. Understanding this need, we designed a software platform called Constant Therapy, which is available commercially today. In this platform, patients can download the software onto their iPads um, and practice at home the therapy exercises. Clinicians can also set up an account and, and assign specific therapies to their patients. Patients can practice therapy anytime, anywhere in the comfort of their homes and monitor their prognosis as time goes by. Clinicians who sit in their offices can remotely monitor the progress of their patients as well. In the preliminary study that we did, we had patients, experimental patients and control patients come into the clinic and receive therapy once a week. The experimental patients then went home and were asked to practice as much therapy as they could at their homes. What we found was that the experimental patients practice up to four and a half hours of therapy relative to the control patients, and this extra practice translated to increased improvements on the standardized language tests. Today, tens of thousands of patients are using constant therapy across the world and in most English-speaking countries. Collecting this amount of data has allowed us to ask those really hard questions about what treatments work for these individuals, how can they improve, and what would be our expectations for gains. For example, this figure shows that people who have a stroke and who are mildly impaired can improve and achieve mastery in their language tasks. But it also shows that patients who are severely impaired can also achieve mastery in their tasks. They just need a lot more practice. Now, this is a profound finding at many levels. First of all, it gives hope to those people who are written off in the medical insurance system because they're being told by the doctors that they're not going to improve anymore. Well, this data suggests otherwise. The other important point is it reaffirms the, the point I made at the beginning of the talk, which is the brain can recover after a stroke and can uh, improve. Moving further, we can also predict treatment outcomes with this kind of data and make specialized predictions for individual patients. So here's somebody who's had a stroke, who's 40 years old, has had this problem for five years. His prediction, his trajectory of recovery is quite different from somebody else who's also 40 years old, who's also had this problem for five years, but is much more severely impaired. What we hope to see in the future is that a person who has a stroke after he's discharged from the hospital, goes to a lab or a clinic, gets a complete neuro profile workup done, gets a complete cognitive language profile workup done, but also gets a functional profile. This is understanding what their education is, what their family environment is, and what their goals and aspirations are. Once we get this information, we think that we'll be able to use it using algorithms to predict an individualized plan for that particular person. This could be that this person receives intensive language or cognitive rehabilitation. It could be that this person needs to be in a supportive social environment, conversing with other people. Or it could be some sort of vocational training where you help them get back into their previous job. I'm going to give you a specific example here. Let's say John had a stroke. Go, once he's discharged from the hospital, gets a complete language and cognitive profile workup done. The prediction algorithms would then say that John should receive intensive language therapy with a speech language clinician one-on-one. -on -one. Then this person should get a social functional kind of training with family members and support, and then should receive uh, vocational training so he can go back to his job. Compare that to someone like Sally, who's also had a stroke, who's also had a complete language and cognitive workup done, but now Sally's had a much severe stroke. So Sally's recommendation would then be that she, go, she receives some individual therapy, but most of her therapy is in a supportive environment 
provided by family members with a lot of assistance. She may not ever go back to work, so what she needs is training of her caregivers to help her lead a successful life with aphasia. The point is that people may have different trajectories to their recovery, but the data today allows us to make precise predictions of what might that look like for individual people so that they can successfully live with this long-term disability. The future of rehabilitation then is on demand, it's data-driven, and it's personalized. I'm going to leave you with a video of somebody who's a good example of how this all comes together. I am a teacher and I had the AVM. For uh, like three months, I didn't talk at all. A constant therapy is uh, miraculous for me. And every year I have made progress. Even the superintendent of Lynn Public Schools uh, just saw me uh, Tuesday and she said, Mary, you talk almost perfect. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you.